All right. Well, I, I think we've probably got a a good <clears throat> chunk of folks online. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I want to welcome all you all to our first uh, shelter series event. My name is Clarissa Goodlett, and I'm the communications director at Preservation North Carolina. Um, during this time when sheltering has become a central part of our lives, we wanted to create a space to connect with you to explore the culture, architecture, diversity, and stories of the many buildings and houses that serve as shelters across our state. This is the first of many shelter series events we hope to bring to you. This afternoon, we're excited to present Lost Wilmington, sponsored by Mike and Mary Cockrell. And our presenters today are historian and author Beverly Tetterton. Beverly was a research librarian in the North Carolina room at the New Hanover Public County Public Library for 31 years. She was a pioneer in digital archives, creating the first in North Carolina. She went on to create numerous digital archive collections, which include thousands of historic photographs of the Cape Fear region. She has served on the boards of the historic Wilmington Foundation, the Bellamy Mansion Museum, the Federation of North Carolina Historical Societies, North Carolina Genealogical Society, and the Old New Hanover Genealogical Society. Her book, Wilmington Lost But Not Forgotten, is the basis for today's presentation. Many of you know our other presenter, Gareth Evans the director of the Bellamy Mansion Museum in Wilmington. Gareth has lived and worked in Wilmington since 1997. He came to North Carolina from his native Wales after finishing an undergraduate degree in history and American studies. After completing a master's degree in American history at UNC Wilmington, Gareth worked at the historic Wilmington Foundation and joined the Preservation North Carolina team as director of the Bellamy Mansion in 2010. Uh, so before I turn it over to Gareth, I just wanted to quickly go over a few um, webinar uh, FYIs for those of you who may be newish to Zoom. I think most of us out there are probably Zoom Zoom pros at this point, but in case you're not, just wanted to give you an opportunity to um, understand how we're handling our uh, Q&A session. So I'm going to stop sharing this screen. Uh, all right, so um, as I mentioned, this is our first webinar event. <laughs> so we're kind of guinea pigs on this one. So please be kind. We're certainly interested in your feedback um, about what happened today. Um, as you can tell, hopefully everyone is muted it's, and your video is disabled except for our panelists. Um, we can't hear you or see you, but we know you're there and we appreciate you coming. Um, we're, I think we're close to 100 folks right now, so it's a, a good crowd. Um, so thank you all for being a part of this. We're recording the webinar. It will be available to view later on our digital channels at um, presency.org, on YouTube, and on Facebook. And we are live streaming on Facebook right now. Um, if you're having any technical issues, Please utilize the chat function and we'll do our best to assist you. Um, we're happy to crowdsource um, any problems. So if you are an attendee and you see somebody type in an issue they're having in the chat and you know what to do, if you'll please <laughs> respond to them, that would be super um, helpful to us. And um, how to ask a question. So I'll be moderating questions from attendees. Um, you can ask a question throughout the presentation, but we'll, we'll save the, the answering of the questions to our, to our Q&A session um, immediately following the presentation. Um, down at the bottom of this uh, screen, I, I think you that's what you all should have um, on your screen as panelists, those, those functions. Um, so there's a chat function, um, which I know folks have been using already. And then um, on the far right is a Q&A button 
to type in your questions. You can ask them anonymously or with your name. If you give me your name, I'll, I'll, I'll use your name. Um, and then you can also raise your hand to ask a question. And I, um, if you all will wait till the end, till the actual Q&A session to use the raise your hand button and I can um, unmute you and you can ask your question live. And then um, lastly, at the very end, once you exit the webinar when we're finished, um, there's gonna be a pop-up um, to link you to a quick survey. Um, it's, it's really short. Um, if you all would just take a few minutes to um, respond to that, that will be very helpful for us as we're moving forward. Like I said, this is the first of what we hope will be many and we wanna keep improving. So if you guys will let us know what worked, what didn't, other topics you're interested in, that'll be, um, again, really helpful for us. And now I'm going to turn it over to Gareth. Excellent. Let me get a setup here. I will put myself on video. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, I really appreciate you being a part of this. And of course, I want to thank in particular Beverly for writing the book and for being here as well. Um, I'm narrating it because I didn't want to put her in the position of having to do all the work for this. So uh, here we go. There is a front cover of the book and we will visit the um, Bailey Theatre in a few minutes. So let's get started. An early example of Lost Wilmington is Maynard, a house north of town and on the site of the current municipal water treatment plant. It was the 1750 home of Revolutionary War statesman Cornelius Harnett. Harnett was a merchant and farmer who led the regional Sons of Liberty, then the Council of Safety for the Revolutionary State, and he was a delegate for North Carolina to the Continental Congress from 1777 to 79. In 1774, the property sold to John Hill and was renamed Hilton. The image here is from an 1855 newspaper and the house lost in 1892. You go to the bottom right. In 1770, William Hooper purchased a house in downtown Wilmington in the center of the 200 block of Market Street. That spot now features a bank and parking lot. Like Harnett, Hooper also represented the state in the 1777 Continental Congress and was one of three North Carolinians to sign the Declaration of Independence. During the 19th century, a second story was added and this dwelling became a dependency for a house that faced Second Street. In 1882, the town's first known act of historic preservation occurred when Colonel Roger Moore suggested that the association with the signer of the Declaration warranted saving the building and moving it to a public park. Instead, it was torn down. We're moving forward and we're going to do this in um, types of buildings as we move through the centuries. That's how we sort of organize this one. Here, we... please speak up a little. It's Clarissa. Sorry. I can indeed. Is that better? Is that better, indeed. folks? It sounds louder. Yes. Okay, I will indeed. I'll get closer indeed. Slide, uh, here we go. Downtown Wilmington, with its proximity to the river and the port, has always been a focal point for entertainment. And that brings us to this type of theaters. The Victoria Carolina Colony Theater, for example, near the corner of Second and Market. Over its decades in operation, this theater underwent changes in both appearance and names. It began as Victoria in 1913 after replacing the demolished Bonnets Hotel. With 1,100 seats, it boasted a state-of-the-art lighting array nine sets of curtains, and scenes painted by noted theatrical artisans Colma Studio of Washington, D.C. It showed both moving pictures and live vaudeville. That means juggling, comedy, singing, and dancing acts. In 1930, a movie sound system was installed for talkies, and it became the Carolina Theater. In 1934, this became the most opulent movie theater in the city, with a gold and cream paint renovation, gold curtains, plush seats, and ushers in tuxedos. In 1954, new management renamed it The Colony. It was managed by Edward Marks in a style noted for eye-catching marquees and promotions. 
The downtown movies moved to the suburbs in the 1970s and it closed in 1974, with the building falling in 1975. Pictured on the right and two blocks away from the colony was the Bailey Theatre, on the front cover of the book too. It was begun by George Bailey of Asheville, who was manager of the Academy of Music, now Thalian Hall. He bought a hotel at 1618 North Front Street in 1939, demolished it and created a modern, comfortable and attractive new theater with seating for 1,250. Mr. Bailey died months before the project was completed in 1940 and the theater took his name. This being the segregated South, there were two balconies, one for African-Americans and one for whites until desegregation occurred in the 1960s. Featuring Wilmington's only wide screen, the Bailey was home to first run pictures and was blissfully air conditioned. This is an attraction much mentioned by patrons. The phrase, always healthfully cool and comfortable, was printed under the prominent marquee. But again, the growth of suburbia meant an end to downtown business, and the Bailey showed its last movie in 1980. This art modern facade still exists on Front Street and is seen here used as a backdrop in a movie production and in its current form awaiting redevelopment again. In 1906, Wilmington's first movie theater began in a tent at 225 North Front Street. Veteran performers James Foxy Howard and P.W. Wells leased this lot. They placed a screen in their tent, sprinkled sawdust and put out 300 folding chairs. Foxy Howard would stand in front with a megaphone calling, never out, never over, always going on. Nothing cheap about it, but the price of admission. They called it the Bijou, which means a jewel or something small and fine. Business was so good for what was reputed to be the first moving picture theater in the state, that the elaborate building with its plaster angels and ionic pilasters opened in 1912. It was designed by local architect Burrett Stevens who also designed many of the large houses in one of the first streetcar suburbs, Carolina Heights, about 15 blocks away. The building cost $40,000 and was built in the latest Vogue. It was an extremely popular theater until the 1950s when television began to reduce movie audiences and it had to compete with other downtown theaters. The photo of this wonderful facade is from around 1920. The Bijou closed in 1956 and it was torn down in 1963. All that remains on Front Street is a small piece of colorful tile, which you can see here, with the name Bijou on it, and a pocket park beyond. Our next theme is banks. This one, designed by Philadelphia architect Samuel Sloan, was the Bank of New Hanover, and it opened in 1873. It contained elements of Second Empire and Moorish Revival style architecture. Sloan also designed the Temple of Israel, the oldest Jewish house of worship in the state at 4th and Market a few years later. After 1902, several other banks occupied this building, but in 1959, it was torn down and a new, more modern bank took its place. That brutalist structure lasted until 2003, when tenants Wachovia Bank moved elsewhere. The structure was torn down, leaving a big hole at the northwest corner of Front and Princess Streets that's still there today, again awaiting another new life. Again indicative of the move to modernism and for urban renewal, which you're gonna see as a theme, is the Southern Building on the corner of Front and Chestnut, opposite the post office. A five-story office block built in 1904 and designed by local architect Charles McMillan that replaced an existing house with stores on the ground floor and 70 offices above. Built on a steel frame with red brick and brownstone, the facade was 66 feet and the side towards the river down the hill there, 155. The building had steam heat, electric and gas lights, and an elevator. Dry goods, Crawford's Fashions, Rita Florists, and many other notable stores in town occupied the retail spaces. Upstairs, insurers, dentists, attorneys, realtors, they filled the offices for 55 years. In 1959, in need of repair and competing with new suburban locations, the building became less desirable. It was torn down 
and replaced by a modernist bank building, designed again in a brutalist style, which was fashionable, by bony architects. Now that building still stands. It's been vacated by Bank of America for well over a decade when they moved again to more car accessible suburban spaces. Fires at churches and the replacement of those buildings have been remarkably frequent over the centuries. Several congregations have rebuilt multiple times and at least 16 major downtown churches in Wilmington have experienced this unhappy fate. For example, three fires have plagued Wilmington's First Presbyterian churches. In 1818, a First Presbyterian was built and burned a year later at Front and Dock Streets. In 1859, its replacement on the site burned down too. And then, shortly after that second First Presbyterian burned, the handsome brick structure pictured top left here was built at 121 Third Street. Samuel Sloan of Philadelphia was the architect. And unfortunately, on December 21st, 1925, this latest First Presbyterian was destroyed by yet another devastating fire. Its replacement was Gothic Revival and mostly made of stone, so it didn't catch fire, hopefully, and designed by Hobart Upjohn of New York. It remains happily unscathed and is a soaring, a beautiful, actually, landmark on the south side of downtown. St. John's Episcopal Church was built on the northeast corner of 3rd and Red Cross Streets in 1855. It was designed by Willis and Dudley of New York, again in Gothic Revival style. In 1861, when North Carolina seceded from the Union, the first rector, J.A. Wainwright, fled due to his Union sympathies. The congregation dwindled during the war, and consecration occurred finally in 1867. Decades of congregation building followed into World War II. At that point, with the non-air-conditioned building in serious need of repair, the members decided to move to the Forest Hills suburb. The building was demolished just shy of its centennial in 1954, and today, as you can see, it's the site of a gas station. We're moving on to municipal buildings. Uh, this 1906 postcard depicts the front of Wilmington's original massive brownstone post office in the top left. That opened in 1891. It was designed by W.A. Ferrey, supervising architect of the U.S. Department of the Treasury. This post office was torn down and replaced by the current one in 1936. That's the bottom right. Many Wilmingtonians tried to save the old building, which I'm sure you noticed was only 45 years old. However, the newspaper mentioned failings and modernization yet again became an issue. Also, planning came during the Great Depression, and the construction of a new building brought employment during that crisis. In 1936, this new colonial revival style brick building appeared on the same spot, featuring a riverfront mural and carved reliefs inside. It remains the central post office for the city. At the rear of that original post office was this park. This is a previously unseen 1914 photograph and was taken on 2nd Street looking at the park. On the left you can see the Orton Hotel, we'll be back at that later, and the only building still standing is the Murkison Bank building on the right. Must have been very welcome to have this area of green space in the central business district. You can see right now that it's the rear parking lot and loading zone. We're moving on to hospitals. Here we have James Walker Memorial Hospital. Construction of this four-story red brick building and complex began in 1900. It's located on two city blocks between 10th and 11th, Grace and Red Cross Streets as well, and was a 50-bed facility with modern equipment, a great source of civic pride. The hospital was a gift from Scottish immigrant James Walker. A builder, Walker uh, worked on the U.S. Capitol and the Smithsonian in Washington, before another hospital project brought him to Wilmington. He died in 1901, just before the hospital was complete, sadly. Over the years, local philanthropists added buildings. In 1904, for example, William Sprunt built a ward for African-American patients and a nurse's dormitory. In the same year, James and Luola Sprunt Murkison built a maternity and children's ward in memory of their daughter, Maria, who had died of scarlet fever. 
Nurses' quarters were added in memory of a beloved local minister in 1920 as the hospital expanded. Only one building remains, which you can see in the bottom right, from that entire complex, and this currently contains apartments. Most of the buildings were closed and demolished after the 1967 creation of the new Hanover, Hanover Memorial Hospital across town. Here we have Baby's Hospital, which opened its doors to sick infants and children in 1920. Dr. James Buren Sidbury, who had practiced pediatrics in New York, brought innovation to Wilmington in 1915. First, he took a converted wood frame beach cottage overlooking Wrightsville Sound and accepted donations of furnishings and equipment. Double story screened porches kept out biting insects and allowed for fresh sea air to come in. Mothers were allowed to stay with their kids, which was an innovation, to help them and learn how to continue treatment at home. The doctor took in charity cases and the building added wings. In 1927, however, the hospital burned completely. One year later, Sibri opened a new, fireproof, two-story hospital in this Mediterranean style. More large screen porches, new wings, a third floor endowed by philanthropist Jesse Keenan Wise, and year-round use followed. Dr. Sibri was director from 1920 until his death in 1967, treating thousands of kids. But centralization of hospitals led to closure in 1978 and the building became offices. In 1996, a new owner revealed plans for redevelopment and despite years of preservation efforts by hundreds of people, which includes me and Beverly, the building was raised in 2004. The proposed supermarket on site was never built. So it sat unused for a decade until condos and retail filled the space as you see there in the top left. Hey, Gareth, yeah. can you speak up a little bit again? Sure. Rolled into a comfortable place. <laughs> I'm sure I am, thank you. <laughs> Next up, we have another hospital, but an odd one in this case. Constructed in 1912, this building was originally a privately owned hospital with 40 patients and five nurses. Harper's Sanitarium was named for owner Dr. Charles Harper. He died in 1915 and the building was never used as a hospital again. Southside Drug Company occupied the ground floor of the Mission Revival style building from 1910 to 1963. Located on the northeast corner of Front and Castle Streets, the building was torn down in 1970 when neighborhood drugstores were replaced by major chains. A house on a similar footprint is built quite recently and uh, after decades of this being an empty lot. Now we're going to move on to the railroad, a huge deal for Wilmington over the years. The Wilmington to Weldon, later Atlantic Coastline Railroad, linked the Cape Fear River port to all points inland for 125 years. By the 1950s, the railroad complex was both sprawling and the city's major employer. Maintenance sheds, lines, and huge, uh, the huge Grand Union Station, plus a roundhouse and freight yards filled the riverside blocks. You can see them all on this uh, picture too. Startlingly, and you look at the stars, only three of these buildings remain today. So memorize what you're watching, and here we go. What you see here is essentially the same shot. Those surviving buildings are starred and they really are, they're the two sheds and office space, now parts of a convention center and the railroad museum. Most of this area has been redeveloped into Cape Fear Community College. Beginning in 1889, the Wilmington and Weldon Railroad uh, constructed an impressive, this one, three-story brick office building on the west side of Front Street between Red Cross and Walnut. By 1900, two or more sections were added and featured a central bell tower and beautifully arched doors and windows for this office building. After the railroad left Wilmington, urban renewal meant demolition in 1962, and the site is now the main classroom building for Cape Fear Community College, as you see there bottom right. Wilmington was a railroad town until December 10th, 1955. Black Thursday, as it was evocatively known, 
was the day the railroad announced that it was moving its headquarters to Florida. By 1960, the transfer was complete and 1,300 employees, and lots of attendant businesses, of course, had transferred out of Wilmington. Union Station, the most memorable of the railroad buildings, was built in 1913. Joseph Leighton, an architect from Wilmington, designed this neoclassical revival style building. Fluted pilasters with ionic capitals repeated the ionic column you can see in this picture that supported the enclosed concourse that crossed North Front Street. The multi faced clock that topped the column became a city landmark. The building was abandoned after the ACL left Wilmington, and during the 1960s, various uses were put forward. Finally, an architect hired by the city reported it's not very old was of little architectural significance, and since they could find no tenants, it should be torn down. The demolition that's pictured here is in 1970. The curved entrance of the current community college building, which is pretty new, on that corner, and is also now named Union Station, reflects its predecessor. If you look carefully at this next slide, you can see that everyone in the windows and on the ground are looking at the camera. They're posed at Worth and Worth Company, which was located at the foot of Mulberry, now called Grace Street. Brothers Brazilla Gardner Worth and David Gaston Worth were general shipping and commission merchants. When this photograph was taken, around 1895, they were the agents for the Philadelphia and Southern Steamboat Company, as well as dealers in fertilizers, lime, molasses, salt, and coal. Located on the south side of Gray Street and the Cape Fear River, it was torn down in the late 1940s. And you can really not tell where it is. It's about where that tree is on the river next to the brand new Hilton, or the newer Hilton. We're moving on up the street into residential. The McRae House was located at 713 Market Street. Built in 1853 in Italianate style, the house was changed to look more like a castle when Donald McRae purchased it in 1859. It reflected his pride in being of Scottish descent. His son Hugh McRae remodeled the house again in 1902. He entertained President Taft at breakfast there on a trip to Wilmington in 1909, and the grand old building was torn down in 1955, and a modest social security and employment office sits there today. Beverly and I went out and took before and after shots of a lot of these sites. Right next door is this next house. The Elizabeth Hashagen Vollers house was built in 1904. Located at 719 Market, this is an imposing neoclassical revival house designed by prolific local architect Henry Bonnets. A widow, Mrs. Vollers died three years after its construction and her child, Catherine Vollers, lived in the house until 1964. A late 1960s fire damaged the house and it again was torn down for the pictured probation offices. Quite the change. The Samuel Bear House is located at 311 North Front Street. The Italianate style house was the home of Samuel and Babette Bear. They were German Jewish immigrants who came to Wilmington before the Civil War. He ran a dry good business. The house was located where the cotton exchange is today. And you can't quite tell where you are uh, without seeing these after shots, I think. Now this shot is right around the corner at Water and Grace. It features the Bear family business. Little in this 1950s photograph is recognizable today. Beverly, our intrepid author here, is standing about, I'm guessing, where the large open door was on the picture top left. The Samuel Beer and Son building is now the Cotton Exchange parking lot. The next building up the hill toward Front Street was the Brunswick Hotel, now a vacant lot. The break between the Bear building and the hotel you see here is Nut Street, which now ends two blocks away. So all these buildings were torn down in 1970. The only one still standing is way up the hill at the very top there across Front Street. The P.K. Dickinson House was located on the northeast corner of Front and Chestnut, again across the street from the post office. This was a Greek revival style house built after an 1843 fire 
destroy the northern part of the central business district from Princess Street to the railroad depot. There's an American flag flying over the house because this drawing was made during the February 1865 occupation of Wilmington by the Union. At the time, US Army General John Schofield occupied the house. It was torn down in 1902. Dickinson's second wife was Alice London Dixon. When her sister died, she raised her nephew Pembroke Jones here, and more on him later. He made his fortune from rice milling, and he built a country estate on Wrightsville Sound, which will be our last port of call. It's known as Airlie. This picture shows the current Bellamy Museum parking lot in the bottom right. In 1895, it was the site of the stately Queen Anne style Robert Rankin Bellamy House. A successful druggist, he built his home next to the Bellamy Mansion he was born in. It was being used as home for handicapped children and burned down, thankfully empty, on Christmas Day, 1980. John Bellamy Jr., Robert's brother, was a lawyer and U.S. congressman whose election was instrumental in fomenting the 1898 massacre in Wilmington. His house was at 602 Market Street and began as an imposing Italianate, top left, but became a Queen Anne, top right, with extensive modifications. Built in the 1890s on a corner lot, one block as well from the Bellamy Mansion, uh, that John Jr. grew up in, he took the house to late Victorian extremes by adding that tower called locally the German helmet and eclectically decorative porches. The renovation by Charles Macmillan was equally grand on the inside. Oak, cherry and mahogany were used lavishly. A ballroom was created on the top floor and paneled silk onyx fireplaces and tapestries appeared throughout. It burned down in August of 1972. While a lawyer's office sits in its place, there are the remnants, you can go there right now today, of Bellamy's carriage house, still just about, and a lot of vines, standing in the rear parking lot. We move on to commerce and hotels. At the major intersection of downtown Wilmington at 3rd and Market sat the Colonial Inn, a handsome four-story building of hydraulic pressed white brick and granite. It was built by wholesale grocer Oscar Pearsall for $35,000 in 1904. A bus was bought to pick up guests from the railroad station and it was close to the port. But by 1915, business was slow, so Pearsall remodeled for luxury apartments. This was a greater success thanks to the novelty of an elevator, steamed heat and phones. However, it was lost to fire in 1962. Next door to it from 1913 was this YMCA, five floors with a pool, meeting rooms and an auditorium and heavily used. In 1970, the Y moved to a modern building further into the suburbs along Market, and this YMCA was demolished. Both spots are still surface parking lots, as you can see here. One of several grand long lost hotels in downtown, the Orton was opened in 1885 by Colonel Kenneth Murkison. Named for his Brunswick County plantation, it features a Murkison agricultural store on the ground floor. And upstairs, the aim was for northern style grandeur. Brussels carpets, Dresden china, oriental rugs, furniture in brocade, velvet and silk, oil paintings and a grand piano were all lit by a large chandelier. In 1888, an adjacent building at 109 North Front Street was created, pictured here, which took this opulence to even a whole new level. A spectacular two-story porch was much photographed and the proprietor advertised magnificent furnishings, quiet elegance, unexcelled management, which was modest, and every modern convenience. The two buildings were connected and allowed for ladies and gentlemen's entrances. The upper veranda was a series of continuous arches with gilded letters spelling the Orton woven into the fretwork. Murkison died in 1904, and the next year, James Hinton, who had worked from storeroom up to manager, upgraded with new upper stories, electric lights, elevator, running water and phones. Now with 160 rooms, it was a huge attraction to the well-off. But by the mid-20th century, competition and decay had set in. 
1949, a huge fire destroyed the Orton, pictured on the right there. All that now remains is the basement billiard hall, which you can visit still and play pool as the Orton Pool Hall. Our last stop on this brief tour of lost buildings is out on the water. Early was the home of Standard Rice Company President Pembroke Jones. In 1902, he began purchasing land on Wrightsville Sound until he'd accumulated 2,000 acres. Pines and hardwoods, lakes, and the wildlife of the waterways were everywhere. And the plan was for a home and hunting lodge as well. The home pictured here, and not previously published, was grand and rambling, featuring multiple porches and guest rooms. Pembroke Park, the lodge, was an Italian style villa costing some $50,000. That's a lot for the time. Black walnut finishes, vaulted ceilings, marble floors, and furniture imported from Tuscany were part of what Jones called the bungalow. The site also featured grand gardens and a temple of love designed by John Russell Pope, architect of the Jefferson Memorial and Jones' son-in-law. Four pools circled this six-column coquina gazebo, each pool holding different fish. Coquina, by the way, is a decorative seashell and concrete mix. Northern elites came to visit this place, the Flaglers, Vanderbilts, and Astors, and once a lavish dinner was held on a special platform built in the limbs of a giant oak. After Jones died in 1919, the property fell into disrepair and was a local teen rite of passage to spend a night in the spooky tumble-down structure. The villa burned in 1955. Now the vast grounds are part of Early Gardens, which is essentially a county park where you can enjoy the ponds and plantings. The Temple of Love is all that remains and is located in the nearby landfall community. And with that, I hope you all heard that enough and I spoke up. We are done for right now and I will hand it back to Clarissa and you can ask Beverly and ask as many questions as you'd like. Hey everyone. Um, yeah, so we are open now for questions. So there are again two ways to do that. Um, you can raise your hand and I'll unmute you and you can ask your question live or you can um, type your question into the, the Q&A button. So we have got a raised hand here. Let's see. I'm just going to say First Beverly. Got, uh, Catherine Koppel. I apologize if I said your last name wrong. I want to unmute you so you can ask your question. You may have to unmute yourself too, Catherine. Can you hear me? Yes, we can okay. hear you. Okay. Um, you keep mentioning how many buildings were lost to fires. Uh, was this due to arson on the whole, or is it was it just uh, an inevitable consequence of the style of building and, and the ratio of fires was no different in any other city. I'd let Beverly answer this. Um, Beverly, if you'll unmute yourself and put yourself on video, um, you can take that one. Mute. <laughs> there you go. Okay, well, um, the uh, one of the reasons that the city burned so often is that what it was a port. So when you walk on the river walk today and you see, you know, this beauty and nothing, I mean, in the earlier years, it was including until the railroad left and afterwards, it was a port with, um, all kinds of wharves and so you've got tar pitch turpentine you have steamships coming in you've got boats coming in and there are sparks from boats and often what happened is it would just uh catch the city on fire and it's because of that that we have one of the first fire boats 
in the United States and we still have one. Um, so yeah, and then of course a lot of it could have been for other reasons, but that was the main reason is the port. Thank you. We've got a question from Linda Potts. I'm gonna unmute you, Linda, so you can ask your question. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't have a question. <laughs> okay, I saw you had a hand raised. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. I must have done oh, I'll ask a question. Oh, okay, my husband, he's here too. He has a question. Okay. Okay, uh, I play pool at Orton's uh, frequently, well, before this corona thing came in. And it has been said that it is the oldest continuously operating pool room in the United States, true or false? I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they say a lot of stuff about that pool room, um, whether it's true or not. I really don't know. But it has been I, said that it was operating since the Civil War. Yeah, and they say that, that the oldest bar that's still in operation is in New Orleans, right, Dan? Well, that wouldn't have been a bar. It's a pool room. No, I'm, I'm just saying that, you know, people say these things about other cities. and. Okay, thank you. It is old, though. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I'm going to take some questions from the Q&A section. So somebody asked, uh, Ruth Little asked, why are there so many fires? I think Beverly answered that. Are you good with that, that answer, Ruth? You can type if you are. Um, and then we have a question from Kay Ramsey. How do you see the support for preservation in Wilmington today? I'll let Gareth answer that. I'm... As far as, I mean, I've worked for the Historic Wilmington Foundation for eight years, and then now it's been over 10 at Bellamy, which is, of course, owned by Preservation North Carolina. Um, it's, I think it's very vibrant the way that people, in, you know, interact with the preservation community. They realize that um, downtown's kind of the jewel. That's the economic driver. I know it's number two reasons it's the number two reason people come to Wilmington. The first one apparently is the beach. The second one is downtown. And without it looking like what it looks like in terms of, you know, historic fabric, um, I don't know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to live here. <laughs> and I think a lot of people feel the same way. So I also know that elected officials feel the same way because they make sure that the historic districts remain intact. And that's a, a good thing. So I think there's an awful lot of support, of course, it's history, so we're going to argue a lot about it, but um, it's, yeah, I think it's very strong in Wilmington. All right. Um, our next question is from Paula uh, Stiles. Very interesting talk. What effect did hurricanes have on building survival history? Beverly, that's you. Well, I mean, hurricanes have been terrible. Um, having been a member of the Temple of Israel and living in an old house and being a volunteer, uh, I'm also on the board of Thalian Hall Center for the Performing Arts. Hurricane Florence ripped through um, Wilmington, the Temple of Israel, we just got a sacred spaces grant because it was so bad. Nobody could go to the Bellamy, right, Gareth? There was terrible problems. There were carpets. And Thalian Hall and the City Hall uh, over there, it was, it was terrible. Um, so no matter what you do, um, it seems like there's always going to be problems, but you know, if you have an old house and you love it, then you find a grant or fix it up or. I could add, add as well, by the way, that um, in Beverly's book, there's like 150 entries, right? And we did about 33 or something like that here. Um, the entries go by area as well so when you go out to the beaches like carolina beach or wrightsville beach you can imagine what hurricanes do out there wrightsville beach seems to have burned down at least twice everything on it almost there's so little that's left of these fantastic hotels 
and she has pictures of and things like that. Lumina, another building that came down, which is famous in this area. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's that's everywhere where beach communities get pummeled by um, hurricanes. At last in Florence, yeah, the, the part of the roof came off the Bellamy and uh, water came down through all five floors. So it's kind of, you know, as they get stronger. Um, and speaking of churches, I don't know one old church in my neighborhood that did not have a lot of damage. St. Paul's Lutheran, First Presbyterian, St. James, Episcopal, St. Stephen's, AME. That's why you have insurance. <laughs> um, so we've got a question, a raised hand from Ronnie Thomas. I'm going to unmute you, Ronnie, so you can ask your question. Hi, I'm Ronnie's husband. Uh, <laughs> We're here together. <laughs> yes. uh, first of all, thank you very much. This is very illuminating. Um, I just finished uh, Wilmington Lies and uh, have studied the, the, uh, the coup of 1898. And this is to Gareth. Is there any, uh, any plans to uh, expound upon that that sordid history, in uh, in terms of Wilmington's history and and its uh, and and its building infrastructure, which was which is, was involved in it, uh, for uh, for you know the rest of us to see or for visitors to see. You mean like a sort of a walking tour or something like that, maybe? something like that or preservation or or, or remembrance of those buildings that yeah um really into it like the the armory and the and the the uh the uh building the publishing building and things like that right um well it's funny you should say that but beverly and i've been out and and visited a lot of these sites a lot of the buildings are gone um Alex Manley's house, which he's he and his brother Frank had, that's gone. There's nothing on Manhattan Park. Uh, the building you're talking about from the famous picture that's on fire, that's there's nothing in that lot. Um, so while there is an African American Heritage Tour, which Beverly, you write that one? I, think I did, heard. and it's on. Uh, it's on my tour app. There you go. Dan and I finished that one, so you can download my um app well i have several apps walking tours but one of them is african-american but there's also some really good things on there that have been saved like schools and houses and churches uh, so yeah i think you'd find it very interesting and we also do actual walking tours like someday when we could do that um, and I've been doing them for uh, Wellington Parks and Recreation, too. Well, how about the cemetery? A tour of the cemetery, because I'm sure that, is, that possesses I mean, the multiple cemeteries. Well, the, the cemetery you're talking about is Pine Forest, and James Laughlin is the superintendent. And Jim's usually there in the mornings. And if you go um, early in the morning or, you know, like before noon, hopefully he's there and he can show you everything. Plus there's a lot of good, really good signage. Um, it's yeah, my, it's my, well done. My primary question was whether or not the Historical Society plans on, on uh, using that, uh, the, the, the coup as a as a teaching moment and something as something to attract people into Wilmington for that teaching moment. I tell you one thing we were before COVID happened um, in I don't even know what month this is where were we uh, I think it was probably scheduled for last month David Zucchino who wrote Wilmington's Lie was actually coming to speak for us and we'll get him back but he was going to speak 
right next to the Bellamy is, is First Baptist Church and its office, which is the next building, is um, the Armory, the one, the one you mentioned. Okay. So he was going to give that talk in that site. And, you know, I mentioned John Bellamy Jr. and his house across the street from the Mansion Museum that, that we have. Uh, he was, you know, in that house that was part of 1898. He was the congressman for, you know, the Democrats that year. And so our history, the one that we talk about in our museum all the time, is totally bound up in 1898. So with the programming that we do and others, lots of other people do programming. The library did the first yeah. program with David. Great. Right, yeah, yeah. And Leray Umfleet, who wrote a book called Day of Blood, which is based on the um, on the States, 1998, they did it. Uh, they did a whole huge report. And then Leray, who was a, a state archivist, turned it into a book called Day of Blood, which is along with David's book, just really fantastic resources on all this, tells you all the sites, tells you all the history. And she's come to speak for us and Cape Fear Museum and the library a bunch of times too. So the programming's pretty, it's definitely out there. Um, and what resources there are, you know, like built resources, which is what you're asking about. We definitely have um, like a, that walking tour map and now Beverly's app, which is on wilmington.tours, I think. So you can go around and see all that stuff too. So yeah, you can, you can find the resources. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Um, so we've got a couple questions from the Q&A. Um, next one is, are there any buildings at risk at the moment that you're worried about having the same fate as the ones today? Well, you should take a walk through my neighborhood. <laughs> uh, there are lots of them. They're most of them, the ones that I know of are houses. Um, there's, some, there's some patches in the residential districts which are yeah and funnily enough historic wilmington foundation uh does this 11 most endangered which is based on the national <laughs> trust version and there's a list of probably the most you know some years it's the beach cottages it's thematic and then there's specific ones as well so you can actually go and look that up and see the ones which are probably most in need and like preservation north carolina you know all of us that's exactly the same identifying buildings most in need and finding a way to find somebody to preserve them is kind of the whole point of the organization. The, the difference for the Bellamy is that that's the one that they kept. Well, yeah, got a few more questions. Um, where did the pictures come from and how are the pictures archived now? The photographs um, basically came from the North Carolina room at the New Hanover County Public Library, where I worked for a long time. Um, there are some from Cape Fear Museum, but the majority are from the library. And a lot of them are photographs that people uh, gave me and let me make copies of, and then I gave them back. But the copies are also, they're copies of their copies in the North Carolina room at the library. Hey, do you want to put in a plug for your online version of your book? You should. Well, um, I republished my book. It, it's out of print, Lost But Not Forgotten, and they're difficult to find. You can find them on like eBay and things, but they're difficult. But Dan, my business partner, and I republished it um, as an ebook on Amazon. And I added a new chapter and a hundred more photographs. And I don't know if you use e-readers, but I do. And the best thing about an e-reader is you can blow that photograph up really big and you can actually see people in the windows looking at the cameras. So yeah, go to Amazon and if you have an e-reader, it'd be nice. Great, well, so we've got, um See one from Rodney on here. Um, two more that. questions we'll get to. So um, from Ann, who wants to know, are there any plans to preserve or restore anything at Seabreeze? That's a good question. I'm pretty, I'm, I don't think there's much left. Except photographs. 
Seabreeze is an African American community on historically on Snow's Cut down there towards Carolina Beach. And there's a, a road which is like a loop now through what used to be a neighborhood and stores and things. Well, there are like three buildings left down there now, maybe something like that. Yeah, there's not a great deal down there. I, I've never, I've not heard of any plans to retain whatever is there. Got you. All right, and we've got uh, one more question from Dan Sunberg. We enjoy visiting Wilmington a great deal. Are there restaurants with historic ambiance that are little known? You should talk about your uh, pub crawl. Well, yeah, uh, another one of my apps <laughs> is a pub crawl, and it's another walk that I do too. And what I do is as we walk around, I tell you that the um, history of the building that owns the pub, the restaurant, the wine bar, whatever. So there are lots of good restaurants in lots, lots of good old buildings. And that's a whole nother lecture, Garrett, that we could do. Yeah, it is. Um, if you go downtown to about Front and Market Street, you're in the middle of the downtown sort of eating and drinking district and all the buildings that you see, which aren't obviously new, were all offices and stores and warehouses. Um, a lot of them have plaques on them to explain what the history was. Yeah, that's true. So you can check that out as well um, as you go. Historic ambience. Yeah, I mean, most of those that are down there, you know, pressed tin ceilings and exposed brick walls and things. When you look, you see the ghost prints on the outside and things. Um, and the cotton exchange has yep. some. Yeah. So that whole front and water streets has a great deal of that kind of vibe to it. All right. And we just have two more comments I wanted to mention. And um, so from Kelly uh, Colwell, she wanted to say thank you for a wonderful presentation. My grandfather owned Southside Drug, formerly Harper's. Wow. My father was a busy dentist in town and had it demolished. He was told he would be sued if someone was hurt in the building. Homeless were constantly breaking in. He later regretted it. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, we have a statement from Catherine Beicher. It strikes me that many of the losses of the biggest and most spectacular buildings took place before the historic preservation movement really got going nationally and locally, and that some of them could have been read for a new purpose, especially if we had the tax credits back then. Do you think this is an accurate observation? Yes. <laughs> hey, Beverly, you want to talk about when it could have started? Well, the first time uh, was when the Colonial Dames preserved the Bergwin Wright House, and that was in, what, 36? 36, I think, yeah. And uh, they decided that they wanted to have some sort of commission to overlook historic properties, and the city attorney said, what, are you crazy? Nobody's going to do that. And shortly after that, it began in Charleston. So we could have actually had that prior to our sister city to the south. You could have had one of the first historic districts, right? Yeah. And actually, somebody asked Rodney, asked Rodney Swink, a lot was demolished in the 50s and 70s. It's the same kind of question. Historic Wilmington was founded in 1966. Reservation North Carolina is older and, you know, all of this. But that's sort of an urban renewal question. That was, uh, there's a lot of the buildings that I was talking about, the brutalist ones and things which are kind of, um, that was the fashion, you know, you wanted new stuff and old things were swept away if they hadn't already burned and new architecture was put in. That was kind of a, a big fad in the 50s into the 70s, I'd say, particularly down here because all these pictures, these hundreds of pictures in this book, you think, how could you get rid of this magnificent or whatever, not, not even magnificent, this incredibly useful warehouse, but there it was. Yeah, I've, I've been alerted, y'all. We have um, one more question in the, I, you, you just answered Rodney's question, right, Gareth? Yeah, that was in the that chat. Yes. That function. So we had one more question in the chat. We'll do that one. And then 
Um, we will uh, have a few comments at the end and we'll wrap it up. But this question is from Jeff Dalton. What was a turning point for Wilmington in terms of historic pres preservation? Was a significant building torn down and the public reaction created a movement to preserve the city? Go ahead, Garrett. Well, I think I might have answered part of that in that Historic Wilmington was formed in 66. The Okay for Historical Society was 56 and an offshoot was the preservation organization. And that was Elizabeth and Tom Wright, I think, basically started that and got it rolling. And they had the resources to get big, significant buildings and areas of town sort of under protection, which is what Historic Wilmington and Preservation does now with uh, Preservation North Carolina with easements and covenants. So oh, in there, people were tired yeah. of seeing stuff go, I think. Well, also what happened is when the railroad left, yeah. then everybody moved to the suburbs and downtown died. And even when I moved here in 1980, 81 um there were sailor bars there were topless bars it was the, not the kind of place that you wanted to to go to and so there was this big flight and then mr Murkison and mr wright and mrs wright and all those people sort of got together and said this has got to stop this is our heritage this is our you know and thanks to them uh, and the Lower Cape Fear Historical Society, they started saving things. Yeah, it's kind of a, that stuff, and then it's a incremental, you know, it's like now we have, like Baby's Hospital, we had a 10 year, 10 year, I don't know how many years it was, fight over keeping that, which we eventually lost, some are lost, but people got rallied around that sort of thing now. All right, and we had just two comments from Dan, Dan is your partner, right, Beverly? Yes, about Dan that. Camacho. Yes, Dan has <laughs> some comments about um, your app and um, the ebook version of your book. If you wanted to share about that, Beverly, um, Wilmington Tours. Wilmington right. Tours. Well, you can go to uh, our company is Java Dog Press. So if you go to javadogpress.com, you will see everything about us and everything we sell. We also sell books like A Brief History of Wilmington and our apps, our e-tour apps are there too. So it's Java Dog Press. I'll, I'll tap it in the, the uh, chat. Or Dan, if you're still on, if you can type it in the chat, everybody will be able to see it. Um, and what I'll do also is when we share the recording of this, I will include those links um, to Beverly and Dan's um, company and information. Um, but I think that's it. Um, and I wanted to again recognize our sponsor for this very first uh, event. Again, thank you to Mike and Mary Cockrell. Um, and thank you to our, our staff and everybody and all the folks who helped us test this out before <laughs> this afternoon. Um, let's see. And then again, if you guys will um, be sure to take that quick survey um, that's going to pop up as soon as you log out of here, that will be helpful to us. And we are working on um, setting up uh, several of these events throughout um, the year, so please be on the lookout for that. I'm going to ask my um, my boss if he would like to add anything. <laughs> uh, um, thank you, Clarissa, but especially thank you, Gareth and Beverly, for putting this together. I mean, I hope we can do a lot more of these sorts of things. Um, as some of you probably have realized by now, we're probably not going to have a, well, we're not probably. We are not going to have a conference this year uh, in person. Uh, and so what we want to do is ramp up educational levels and actually see if we can hit more people than we might have even hit it with the conference. Next time we want to try to figure out how to, to allow for more uh, interaction among participants, even if we can't figure out a way that y'all can just stay on board for the next hour and talk all you want to. 
Um, so we'll figure that out for the next one. Please give us your your uh, your suggestions and ideas for talks, and we'll see what we can do. And again, thank you, Clarissa. Thank you, Beverly. Thank you, Gareth. All right, that was fun. Welcome. Thanks, everybody. Right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye. All right, bye. bye.